Lotus is back. Yes, they're being reborn as an all-electric luxury brand, and this is the fruits of their labor. It is the all-electric Electra, and it's available in two flavors. There's the range-friendly, comfort-friendly version, which is $265,000, and that'll give you 600 Ks per charge, but then there's this. This is the fancy one. This is the go fast model. It's the R model. And this one, well, it'll set you back starting at 315K. For that, you get 450Ks per charge, but you get a zero to 100 time of 2.9 seconds and a whole lot more. There's so much to cover. Let's crack into it. And we're off. And I've got to say, the last time a Lotus made a positive impression on me was when Roger Moore drove one out of the sea as James Bond. That was an epic scene, and Roger Moore is the best James Bond, and that's just a fact. And even though I may be about as cool as socks and sandals, I feel pretty cool driving this thing. It really is. It's a nice feeling driving this thing. But now let's talk tech specs. And this car, well, everything about it, from the dimensions to the battery to the performance to the spec sheet, it's all big. It's a very big, big car. Starting with the motor output, for a start it has 675 kilowatts with two electric motors and 985 torquing Isaacs. That's almost 1,000 newton meters of torque in a car that weighs 2.7 tons. Told you it's big, and part of the reason for that is its battery. 112 kilowatt hours of battery capacity under this car. That is quite possibly the largest battery pack in any car I've driven. It's staggering. It's also, I think, the most powerful car I've ever driven, but you wouldn't know it by driving it because it's so docile. It's crazy. But even though it's docile here on the streets of Auckland, once you put it into sport mode, it becomes a rabid beast. Putting it into sport mode is easy. I can use the flappy paddles on the right-hand side of the steering wheel. Oh, it wants to go <laughs> far out. Whereas the paddles on the left-hand side can control, crikey, let me take it out of sport mode, control the regen braking. I put it up to max regen. Okay, here's a red light. Let's see if the regen braking will allow me to come to a complete stop. Oh, 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 was it going to? No, it's got creep mode. So it acts like an automatic on a combustion car, but it does almost have complete one pedal driving. That's pretty cool. On the subject of speed, let's talk charging speed. And it has an 800 volt architecture, which that's not revolutionary, but it does mean that you can charge this car at a peak charging rate of 350 kilowatts, which means if you can find a 350 kilowatt charger, this car will charge from 10 to 80% in 20 minutes. Oh, and on the subject of speed, the reason this thing can get to 100 k's an hour in 2.95 seconds is because it has a two-speed gearbox on the rear axle. That's a really unusual thing. It means it maximizes that zero to 100 time, but then when you're on, say, the autobahns of Germany, it means that you can fly along at 200 k's an hour effortlessly without straining the motor too much. Seriously, driving this thing around Auckland with this much power at my disposal, I feel kind of godlike. I'm a pretty humble spud, but this much prestige, this much power, if this is what it feels to be rich, I kind of want to be rich. This is nice. <laughs> but before I get delusions of grandeur and maybe start smiting people, I'd better do a deep dive into what makes this car tick. And well, we don't have too much time. I can't do a real deep dive. I'll do a knee high dive. Like, you know, imagine Miami in 30 years, that kind of dive, starting with comfort. And let's start with these. These seats are adjustable in 20 different ways. They are effortlessly comfortable. They're also heated. Yes, it has seated heats in both the front and passenger seat. And if you opt for the package, you can get cooling as well in both seats. And the same goes for the freeloaders in the back. Heating and cooling is an available option. Both the driver's seat and the passenger seat can be made available with massaging functions. And of course, the seat upholstery can be in either Nappa leather from the finest nappies, or if you're more like me, you can go with the recycled material option, which is largely made of discarded fabric from clothing industries. And that's good because I identify as pure trash. Comfort wise though, it's just a very nice place to be and kind of a difference from the outside, which looks kind of sci-fi, whereas inside is much more calming. It's a really inviting place. I mean, look at the detail. Every inch is covered in soft materials. Let's talk space though, and this car has loads of it because it's massive. Like if I stand outside the car and walk alongside it, it's five meters long. Look how long it is. It is stupidly long, deceptively long, because in the photos it doesn't look that big, but once you're actually standing in front of its presence, it's like, crikey, this is a monster. This is Titanic on wheels. But that means that you get a lot of interior space, starting with the fartment up the front. Yes, it has a fartment or front compartment that is 46 liters. That's pretty good. Then in the boot, yes, it has 611 liters in there, which is more than enough room for an elderly potato enthusiast. 
Plus, if you drop those rear seats down, look how much room you've got. 1,532 litres of space. It is monstrous. As for the interior, yes, there's heaps of room there too. Look at all the headroom I've got. Look at the legroom I've got. And it extends into the back seats as well. Look how much legroom and look how much headroom I've got as a passenger back there. And those rear seats, they are adjustable. Plus, also, if you go for the four-seat option, yes, there's an option you can get which makes this five-seater a four-seater, then the rear has a console in the middle, which means that you've basically got much more adjustable seats. It's more like being chauffeured around in a limousine than it is in a Lotus. Let us now talk exterior design, and while I'm no artologist, I have read that cars cannot, by definition, be art, because art has to be self-serving, and cars serve a purpose, and that, that may be the most intelligent thing that's ever fallen out of my mouth. But there are things in this car, there are aspects that I I think could be considered art. For example, that front grille. Look how it's active and it opens up. That is a work of art, you can't deny it. Then of course you get that light strip around the back. Also, I think because that's not entirely necessary, but it does still, still serve a purpose, I think that's a real piece of art. I'm impressed. What do you think? Do you disagree? I think that's art. That being said, I'm not sure I like this particular part of the car, that rear section there. I think the car is just so big, the designers didn't quite know what to do with it, so it's just a big sheet of metal. But all that considered, it's still a really good looking car. It is slicker than a greased snail. That's the best analogy I can come up with, but it's a really slick looking car. And let's move into the interior of where I'm sitting right now. And this, well, that is really quite something. There's a lot to go on here. I mean, look at every section here is, there's so much attention to detail in every little part of this car. Let's start with the top, I guess, and work our way down, starting with that massive sunroof above my head. It's great, lets a lot of light in, but it's also intelligent. You can adjust it or make it opaque in 10 different shades, which means that you can actually get some privacy. This is something that I think Tesla and BYD need to introduce as an option, because it just gives you so much more privacy. And it also means the car is not gonna be an absolute oven in the hot summer days. Let's move down now to the interior upholstery, and you've got a lot of options. Yes, sure, it's all gray, but amongst that gray, there's a lot of color options. We've got, start with the seat belts, black and yellow, that's a very low to see, a little bit of green in there as well. Yeah, keeping it Lotus themed. And we've also got these sort of bronzy highlights here, goldy bronze highlights here, which I like. Look at the speakers, look how they pop. That's insane. Of course, we've got this lovely felt line feel here, gold accents on the steering wheel. It's a little bit of Liberace all wrapped up in a high performance package. The steering wheel is also pretty cool. Look at this hexagonal steering wheel and look at the, the stitching in this car. It is clinically precise. It's one of those cars where so much attention to detail has been paid to every single aspect, from the way the handles feel to these jewel-like effects on the beveled edges of the cup holders. It's one of those cars where no expense has been spared and that is why it costs so much money. But now, let us talk about gadgets and there is a lot to cover here, starting with this 15.1 inch central display which controls everything in the car. However, there is also a passenger display in the back for backseat passengers. Yes, they get to see where you're going, they can control the air conditioning, all that sort of stuff. Very neat. Speaking of displays, it utilizes this with its 360 degree bird's eye camera system and the definition in that is amazing and you're going to need that because this is a very big car that makes it really easy to park. As does the four wheel steering. Yes, it has active four wheel steering which I've felt turn on a couple of times and it's surreal. You have to experience it to describe it, but it just it gives you that slightly floaty experience when you go around a gentle corner. It's a little bit odd. One gadget I'm not sure I'm keen on, however, is this passenger display here, which is touchscreen, which means that it's a bit too far to reach myself, but it means that if you've got kids, they can just reach out there and change the music with that. That's annoying. I don't think you can turn that off either. That's kind of annoying. You might have to just strap your kids in tight in the seat. Another cool gadget this car has is the interior lighting. The entire car is bathed in whatever color light you like, and even this bronze strip around the car, that changes color as well, depending on the driving mode you have it set on, or also maybe just the battery state of charge. There's a few different things that can affect the, the color, and you can turn that on and off if you like, but I think it's really neat. I'd leave that on. The car also has inbuilt satellite navigation with real-time traffic, and it does have Android and Apple coming soon. That's coming in an update, an over-the-air update, so that is already been booked, it's been paid for, it will arrive, and it's going to be wireless too, so no cables in your beautiful Lotus. Next gadget is LiDAR, and this car has no fewer than four LiDAR sensors scanning 200 meters in all directions of this vehicle. And LiDAR's great, it's better than cameras in low light or in rain or rainy low light. Plus, it also has an army 
of cameras aiming in all directions, plus a telephoto lens aiming forwards 500 meters in front. Plus, of course, with ultrasonic sensors, it means that you've got a barrage of safety systems scanning constantly to make sure you don't hit anything. It'll identify cyclists, it'll identify people on scooters even, it'll identify people walking, and it'll brake automatically to stop you hurting anyone. It's brilliant. Now I know what you're thinking. All of those leaders that could just be a recipe for disaster, you're gonna have to clean them all the time in rainy New Zealand. Well, not so fast, they've thought of that. Each leader has a little water jet system that squirts detergent at it to keep it clean. How sweet is that? Bottom line is this car has a lot of tech in it, more than I can cover in one video, or the video would be like three and a half hours long and no one would watch it. But if you are concerned about all the technology involved, because let's face it, Lotus, it's a British company and I own a British car and the electronics are a little bit crap then I can put your mind at ease. What I'm gonna tell you next is gonna really upset the traditionalists, but reassure the realists. And that is that this entire car platform is running on the Geely SEA platform. Yep, this car is made in China. That means that you've got all the Lotus gadgetry you could ever want, but it's gonna start every day. It's gonna run more like a Toyota Corolla and less like a Lotus. Until you put your foot down, then it's a Lotus. I mean, all of that's really nice, but let's face it, we're driving a car that's designed to go fast and to have fun on the corners, in Auckland traffic doing 46 k's an hour. Where's the fun on that? So let's hit the highway. We're on the motorway, so now's a good time to turn on the adaptive cruise control, which I do by pressing the button, select my maximum speed, I'm gonna select 100, and now the car is driving for me. Now it does have, believe it or not, it does have, with all its radar and lidar and sonic transducers, it has the capacity for level four autonomous driving. Now most cars have level two autonomous driving, that's where it'll do the braking and the steering and the acceleration, but you've got to keep your hands on the wheel. This has the capability of level four, which means you could sit in the back and drive if you got that package and if it was legal in New Zealand. The thing is though, as far as I can tell, autonomous cars are technically legal in New Zealand only because le the legislation was written like 50 years ago. So yeah, you could possibly get away with it, but I think your friendly local constable would disagree with you. As for ride feel, I have the car set to eco mode and the air suspension set to light, so it's all absorbing all those bumps, it's riding along like a cloud. However, one complaint I do have is that the cabin noise is louder than I expected for, for such an expensive upmarket vehicle. I think maybe they could improve some of the noise deadening, especially in the wheel arches, because when you go over a, a bump, that noise translates into the cabin. Not a fan of that. Let's talk range though, and this car has a WLTP range of 450 Ks per charge. Now that's okay. The WLTP cycle, however, is a little bit flawed. I find in New Zealand, you take that figure, take 15% off, and that's your real world figure. So your real world figure is gonna be somewhere in the late 300s, I reckon. However, if you're just doing city driving alone, then yeah, you'll get that 450 Ks per charge, no worries. Speaking of efficiency, this car's official efficiency is 24.2 kilowatt hours or units of electricity per 100 Ks. And that's kind of high for an electric car, at least. It's still very, very cheap to operate. In fact, it uses the equivalent of a car that uses about 2.8 liters of petrol per 100K. That's how much it costs in electricity alone to run this. That's, to put that in perspective, that is less than a 50cc Vespa per 100K. You can't go wrong with that. Plus, with this, there is no tailpipe emissions. And if you run this vehicle on ecotricity electricity, and that's the power that I use, then it's climate positive. That's because Ecotricity is New Zealand's only certified climate positive electricity provider. Yes, all the power is from wind, hydro, solar. No gas, no coal, nothing dirty, nothing expensive. That's how it's certified by Toitu as being climate positive. So why not sign up at ecotricity.co.nz. But now let us carry on south to a little secret driving road I have, and then we'll put this thing through its paces, starting with a zero to 100 time. See you there. And it's time for the zero to 100 time. Let's drop the car into sport mode. There we go. All right, I'm gonna drop the suspension to its lowest setting. Oh, oh, can feel it going. Okay, so I'm just gonna match the accelerator. Now, I haven't done this yet, so brace yourselves. The road is clear, zero to 100 time. I'm a bit nervous. Three, two, one. Oh, was that? Oh, and we're done. <laughs> That's bad. Oh, I just wanna try that one more time. Okay, okay, here we go. Ready? It's like this happened in three seconds. We've never heard that before. Three, two, one. Oh my word! Oh, look at that. It's over, just like that. Far out. <laughs> it's mental. All right, now we're in the corners. We're at speed. Let's see what it's like. 
Now right now I have the sport suspension set up to lowest possible settings, that'll lower its centre of gravity even more. It's got active anti-roll bars working hard, it's got four wheel steering when needed. The air suspension helps as well of course, it's nice and it's quite rigid now. And of course it's also got track mode if you're feeling daring, I am not going to try track mode, I don't have the driving ability for that sort of thing. I'll just stick to regular sport mode, which, oh my god, this is mental. This is lunacy. Oh, my head. <laughs> you just press the accelerator and it far out. What a beast. It's great, it's fun on the corners, but my advice to you is save it for the track. This car is not for the roads. <laughs> and on that note, let's do the spud score. Starting with performance and 10 out of 10, this machine is faster than just about anything else on New Zealand's roads. Handling's next and seven spuds there. It manages its extreme weight excellently on the corners thanks to its brilliant suspension system. What about comfort? Well, I'm giving it nine out of 10 potatoes because when you put the suspension into sponge cake mode, its ride quality is on par with Rolls-Royce. Seriously, experience this if you can. As for efficiency, I'm giving it 4 out of 10. It eats a lot of electrons, but for its size and weight it's not too bad. Gadgetry's next and it gets 9 out of 10. It's got almost everything except vehicle to load. That means you can't plug a device into it and use its massive battery like a power station and a power cut, at least not yet. Is it good value though? Well, no. It's $315,000 so I'm giving it 2 spuds. But let's be honest, if you can afford this piece of magnificence, you're not going to worry about how it compares to a budget EV. Charging's next and I didn't have the time to test its claimed 350 kilowatt peak charging speed, but if it's accurate, then it gets 10 potatoes. As for style, there are many things I love and don't love about this vehicle, but style's subjective, and with a face like mine, I'm far too ugly to cast stone, so I'm giving it 6 out of 10. But is it fit for purpose? Well, this is a simple question with many answers, but all of them are yes. I mean, do you want to go stupidly fast? It'll do it. Do you want to turn heads? It's guaranteed. Do you want to just cruise in spacious comfort? Easy. Do you want to tow your big boat on the weekends? Well, it'll do that too. So I'm giving it 9 out of 10 tubers. And lastly is PSC, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to open the glove box, but despite that, it still held an impressive 68 potatoes, being just one short of the Tesla Model Y's PSC. So I'm giving it 7 out of 10, which gives the Lotus Electra R a total spud score of 73. And that is the spud score for the Lotus Electra. It's done really well, especially in power and specs and gadgetry, but it's not the power and the gadgetry that has really blown me away with this car. It's What's left me really impressed is how I feel driving it. I feel kind of elevated, like uh, more confident, like I could maybe start a business or something like that. I can imagine the sort of buyer that buys this, that must be how they operate every day. It's kind of intoxicating. That being said, if you are a person of means who happens to have a bit of taste, and those two things, they're not as common as you might think together. Yeah, then this might just be worth a test drive.